Good morning, everyone. Trust everyone had a nice restful uh, sleep last night. You're all ready for the conference and all, everything's going on for the next two days. It's great to see everyone. Uh, my name is Larry Lamott and I'm Vice President of Public Policy uh, at, for, the, for IDF and really want to welcome you to the first breakfast symposium of the IDF 2017 National Conference. Before we begin, I want to talk about the surveys that we conduct to evaluate your IDF National Conference experience. Uh, you should have received an email prior to the conf conference with a survey link, and we thank you for completing that pre-conference survey. We will also be notifying you of a post-conference survey where you can provide feedback on this session and all the sessions uh, that you will attend. <clears throat> Excuse me. After the conference, um, the, through the conference app, which I hope everyone has uh, downloaded, uh, you will receive an email to complete that survey. And we thank you in advance for completing, for completing it, because your feedback is absolutely important to us in order for us to understand the impact of the conference that you've had, to use it as a guide for future conferences so that we will be able to meet the needs that you, ha that you have. We try to do our best to do that. So please, uh, uh, at, when you have that opportunity at, after the conference, please do uh, those surveys so we can have better conferences in the future. Now I would like to acknowledge our sponsor of the symposia, Shire and invite up uh, a representative from Shire to say a few words. Tom Larmandra is Director of U.S. Patient Advocacy. Tom? Thanks, Larry. And uh, you may wonder what advocacy means exactly. Sometimes you talk about advocacy when you're talking about being a self-advocate, uh, and that's vitally important. So I think you're really in for a treat here with this session because you can't be a self-advocate, I don't think, unless you are first educated on exactly what you're advocating for. And you may know a little bit here or there, and, and, and this, is, this session, I think, is maybe geared towards folks that are either newer on the, on the diagnosis side, but I think that people that have been um, diagnosed for years and years can still learn something from these kind of presentations. So I applaud you being here. Uh, we at Shire are so grateful to be able to partner with IDF and, and really, from my job on the advocacy side, I get to be on the front lines of our interaction with IDF. And I can tell you that you know, I get a chance to work with many, many different national patient advocacy organizations across lots of different areas. And you're not going to find a group that is more dedicated to your well-being and your best interest. And you're certainly not going to find uh, leadership of that organization that is more actively involved in the day-to-day -day than you do with the folks like Larry and Marsha and others here at IDF. And so I'm so grateful to be able to be here with them on that front. And I'll tell you, I've been in the industry for 20 years in lots of different roles, and it wasn't until I came to Baxter, as you may have known us by, uh, I came on board seven years ago, that I really saw what putting a putting the community first means. Um, and that group was so dedicated towards working for the, the betterment of the community. And that's really what my job is. I, I'm, I'm not the person that, that talks to you about the products that we have. I'm the person that works with Larry and his team and we go to Capitol Hill or we'll go to your states and we will work on trying to make sure that you have access to the therapies that you need. And so, again, I'm just really honored to be able to, to be here. If you do want to find out more about the, the products that we have, certainly we've got the booth uh, next door, and you can talk to the folks there. But, um, you know, it really is our honor to be able to be walking side-by-side uh, -side with Immune Deficiency Foundation on all that they do on working on your behalf. And certainly if there's anything that we can do um, to help you along that path, that's what we're here for. So thank you very much, and I think you're really going to enjoy this session. Uh, 
Uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Tony Bonilla, the Program Director of Clinical Immunology and Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital and a member of the IDF Medical Advisory Committee. Tony? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see uh, so many people here so early. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the symposium, Getting to Know Primary Immunodeficiency. Uh, as you probably already know, the session will be presented by Drs. Joseph Church and uh, Richard Steam. Uh, Dr. Church is the clinical immunology and allergy provider within the Children's Hospital Los Angeles system, and Dr. Steam uh, serves as pediatric medicine, allergy, and immunology provider within the David Geffen School of Medicine as UCLA and is a member of the IDF Medical Advisory Committee as well. If time allows, there will be a Q&A period at the end of the presentation. All questions should be submitted in writing. You should have been handed an index card as you arrived in the room. Uh, if you have a question, please write it on the card. An IDF staff member or volunteer will be around to pick them up, uh, and we will answer as many questions as possible. Thank you for understanding that there is a limited amount of time and all questions may not be answered. We will try to address unanswered questions in the Q&A section of IDF's e-newsletter. Uh, please join me in welcoming Drs. Church and Steam. Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, it is my pleasure to, to be here and uh, be able to talk with you uh, about the immune system. And it uh, uh, was kind of a daunting uh, uh, request. Um, Dr. Steam and I were asked to talk about the immune system. Now, I've been in the business 42 years, and Dick a few years longer than that, and we're still learning about the immune system. So to pack that into uh, an hour is a little bit difficult. But we're going to do our best. My particular interest uh, uh, for this session is introducing some of the concepts that we uh, uh, deal with in uh, the immune system. Now, before, before we go anywhere, um, we need to talk about babies. Babies that become adults that have immune systems. But before we do that, one of the things I've learned is a lot of people don't understand what a gene is, where genes come from, where they're packaged. And so what I did is I put this together to uh, uh, help discussions with people about their child's or uh, adult's uh, primary immune problem. So uh, I don't know if this works here. OK, sorry, I can only point to one. Um, so we start off with an organism, in this case, a baby a human baby. Now, babies, like other uh, uh, humans, are made up of cells. And a cell is the smallest component of living thing that a, an organism can be divided into. So cells have are individual living uh, uh, items, and in the cell is a, a structure called the nucleus. The nucleus of the cell contains chromosomes. The chromosomes, when unraveled, are really our genes in the form of DNA. So DNA is an extraordinarily long molecule, and it provides the code by which our bodies, our cells, make proteins. So this long string of DNA has uh, areas in it that code for specific amino acids that then line up to make proteins. And then eventually, those proteins organize into a cell. Cells then organize into organ systems, heart, lung, uh, blood cells, and all of those together form 
our, a human organism. And so we talk a lot about DNA and uh, um, amino acids and protein defects in immune deficiency. That's where it comes in. If you look, if you read about uh, immunology and you look for a definition of the immune system, most of those definitions will say, well, the immune system is that system that mediates immune responses. Well, my sophomore year in high school English teacher would have shot me if I used that circular definition. So I can't do it. So here is my definition of the immune system. It's the cells and the elements that they produce that together generate a coordinated, controlled, and normally responsive, uh, normal responses to factors that are recognized as foreign. So our immune system is important in recognizing bacteria and viruses, or dangerous or damaged items in the body. So you can still have an immune response against yourself. That's an error. That's when the immune system's not working properly or uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and in those cases, the self system is recognized as something that is dangerous to the body as a whole and has to be removed. So it's a very tight line that the uh, uh, immune system has to follow in order to maintain good protection but not auto-reactivity. And this is a uh, simple uh, concept, the immune immunologic balance, uh, where the uh, uh, neutrophil here is uh, representative of the immune of the immune system, and the uh, uh, little uh, virus-like thing on that end is uh, um, the environment. And normally, the immune system, the environment are balanced, and as they should be. If there is too much, too heavy of an immune response relative to the environmental factors being engaged. We see that as hypersensitivity, allergies, or autoimmune diseases. If, on the other hand, the environment, mostly uh, microorganisms, uh, have the upper hand, the immune system not working properly to respond to and eliminate those uh, microbes, then that is an example of an immune deficiency. So it's a very balanced system most of the time, and it's a complex system. One way to think about it is that uh, we have all these cells, and their job is to defend against bacteria, for example. And uh, I put as the conductor of the immune system uh, the T cell. Now, somebody will argue with that, uh, but uh, let's say the T cell is the, uh, uh, is the uh, conductor. The macrophage dendritic cells are the uh, uh, concert masters, and the other cells also are very much involved in generating an appropriate musical response. And one of the things that this doesn't show is that not only do these cells all produce factors that are there to defend against this bacteria, but information is going back and forth between all of these cells. And much of that information is in the, uh, um, uh, is, is as cytokines or proteins that are created by one cell that talk to another cell. Now the immune system has, uh, um, uh, this is kind of um, uh, really concentrated here because in fact every tissue in every organ of our body is part of the immune system. In this case, we're talking about the major components, uh, uh, the primary uh, immunologic organs, the thymus, which sits here above the heart, bone marrow, 
the spleen, and literally thousands of lymph nodes throughout our body. So those are the major components, and this is where uh, um, bone marrow and thymus and lymph nodes, this is where the interaction between lymphocytes take place. So the bone marrow actually is where uh, these cells are created. All blood cells are initially created in the bone marrow. Some of them stay there and become B cell, antibody producing precursors that then migrate to the lymph nodes. Other cells are precursors uh, to T cells and they migrate to the thymus. So bone marrow is where the T cells and B cells begin and where B cells are educated to respond to specific uh, um, insults, proteins, bacteria, viruses. The thymus is where T cells are educated and lymph nodes and spleen are where they interact uh, to, um, uh, to generate proper, effective immune responses. And it's a very dynamic system. These cells are floating around in our uh, blood circulation. They're percolating in and out of lymph nodes and spleen, all in an attempt to make sure there's a T cell and a B cell around when a microbe or some other uh, negative insult is encountered. Now, to look at blood, for example, uh, uh, this is uh, an illustration I had made because I couldn't find one on the internet. Um, blood is made up of two major components, plasma and blood cells. Blood plasma is liquid. Uh, it's where a lot of proteins uh, are dissolved. It's where antibodies float around in and it represents about 50 to 60 percent of our circulating blood. Blood cells are the other big component. A vast majority of them are red blood cells. That's why blood's red. And uh, the purpose of uh, red blood cells, of course, is to carry oxygen from our lungs through the circulation to deliver oxygen to the tissues, for example, at the tips of our fingers. Platelets are another component. Uh, it's a, they're kind of cell particles, uh, parts of cells that are involved in blood clotting. So if you have low platelets, you have a tendency to bleed. And autoimmune low platelets or thrombocytopenia is a problem not uncommon in CVID. Then, we have the least numerous, but to me, of course, most important uh, part of the uh, of blood are the lymphocytes. And there's a whole bunch of our white blood cells. Sorry, there's a, a, a whole num um, variety of white blood cells. The fur uh, and each of them have a relatively important job to do in protecting us. So, for example, basophils are important for fighting or defending against ticks and also are involved in allergy, allergic reactions. Eosinophils used to be my favorite cell, not anymore. Um, eosinophils uh, uh, defend against worms and uh, are also involved in allergic reactivity. Neutrophils. Neutrophils, somebody uh, mentioned this yesterday, I like the analogy, neutrophils are the marines of the immune system. They're, they're the first off the boat. They, they get uh, where there are problems first and try to clean up before anything else, any other damage goes on. And then monocytes are actually precursors to white blood, uh, to cells that migrate to the tissue and in the tissues, they are uh, phagocytic. They eat bacteria, uh, uh, particularly important for bacteria such as tuberculosis. If you have a problem, for example, with your neutrophils, 
you're uh, like in chronic granulomatous disease, you're more likely to experience recurrent staph infections, among many others. And finally, we have lymphocytes. When I was in training, I was told there were two types of lymphocytes, large and small. And now there are literally dozens upon dozens of types of lymphocytes. As they mature further and further, they, their jobs, their uh, purposes, their functions become more and more specified. But for the purpose of what we're doing here, we're dealing with three types of lymphocytes, T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. Uh, T cells uh, are uh, uh, the ones that are the most numer uh, numerous, uh, and each has a different role in the immune system. B cells, oh, they have lots of jobs. They can be regulatory cells, they can be suppressor cells, uh, but in general, their main job is to be precursors to plasma cells, and plasma cells make antibodies. So if you are born without B cells, you have a B cell problem, and that's going to be A gamma globulinemia. You don't make antibodies. If you're born without T cells, nothing works. So uh, uh, your T cells, B cells don't work uh, and can't fight infection. Finally, natural killer cells are uh, a unique uh, population, and their primary job and this is from individuals who have specific defects in their natural killer cells. Those individuals, quite rare, experience recurrent herpes infections, and that can be herpes simplex, uh, uh, herpes zoster, chicken pox or varicella or shingles, um, her, a CMV, which is a herpes virus, and HPV, human papilloma virus. Now, why those families of viruses and natural killer cells, that I can't explain. And just a picture of uh, some of the uh, cells in a peripheral blood smear. Uh, this is a smaller lymphocyte that uh, is, uh, may be a monocyte or a large lymphocyte, I think more a monocyte. Um, a neutrophil, a couple of neutrophils. And eosinophil, you can see why I like them, uh, uh, because they're nice and red and they're easy to spot. And basophils, uh, representative of the types of cells that are floating around all the time. Now, what's the purpose? Again, this table kind of tells you what the purpose of those cells are. Neutrophils, uh, some are, um, they're a subset of phagocytes. Phagos means in Greek to eat, site cell, so these are big eaters. Uh, so neutrophils literally eat bacteria. And uh, uh, you can imagine an amoeba coming around, seeing a bacterium, attaching to it, and then literally eating and digesting it. That's what their job is. <clears throat> they are also involved in defense against fungi and other microbes. T cells, again, we have two subsets of T cells, helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells that used to be called suppressor cells. Um, they, these cells produce cytokines, factors that are mo usually proteins that talk to other cells. And uh, the uh, cytokines produced by helper cells activate other other lymphocytes, or even activate and attract uh, neutrophils. Cytotoxic T cells are most important for getting rid of your own cells that are virus infected. Important concept here is um, in order to prevent virus infections, antibodies are very good. And that's why we have all the vaccines that we have. Pretty much all of them work by stimulating antibodies, and those antibodies neutralize or eliminate viruses and other types of ba and bacteria. However, once you get a cold or a virus infection, all the antibody in the world doesn't help you. You need these types of cells, cytotoxic T cells and or NK cells, to actually eliminate 
the virus-infected cells, for example, that are lining your nose in a cold. So if your T cells aren't working very well, you are likely to experience recurrent severe viral infections, for example, and the best example of that are babies born with SCID or severe combined immune deficiency. B cells, as I said, they come out of the bone marrow, educated to make antibodies to a particular se sequence of protein, sequence of amino acids, and they're just floating around waiting to be told to start making antibodies. When that signal occurs, they mature into plasma cells, and plasma cells in the uh, uh, lymph nodes, in the spleen, um, uh, in the uh, uh, tissue, uh, subcutaneous tissue, for example, they start making antibodies. Cytokines are the factors produced by cells that communicate signals to other cells. And then antibodies. What, is, what does an antibody actually do? An antibody can attach to a virus, for example. And so many antibodies can attach to a single virus that the virus then doesn't have any ability to attach to the cell it's trying to infect. So it can neutralize a virus that way. Antibody can attach to a, a bacterium and uh, cause uh, activation of the complement system and kill the bacteria. Antibodies can stick to the surface of bacteria like uh, um, an adhesive, two-sided adhesive, that sticks to the bug and then that allows the phagocytic cells to stick to the antibodies that are stuck to the bug. And the phagocytic cell with antibody in the middle engages and eats and kills the microbe. This is, this is a really neat slide because it shows how cells talk to each other. Now we know that B and T cells actually communicate and um, when they attach, uh, the T cell, if all the signals are proper and the signals are occurring here, right in the uh, interval between the T cells and B cells, uh, that's the immunologic synapse. When those cells are there, if the proper signals are going from the T cell to the B cell, B cell to the T cell, the T cell actually starts making a cytokine that tells the B cell to start making antibodies. And you can see at this level, where they're attached, the T cell is making a cytokine that is stained here in green to signal to the B cell, make antibodies. Now, the, uh, if you look at this, um, you can see all of it is concentrated in that tiny area between the T cell and the B cell. So it would be very difficult, let's say you don't make antibodies very well, and um, you would like to give a patient this factor. Okay? The problem is, look at where it's limited to, just that synapse. If you try to give this factor to a person IV or as a, as a shot, you'll kill them because it, those, uh, the concentration that you would have to reach is far higher than you'll be able to do uh, safely. So that, uh, at this point, cytokine therapy, um, trying to add cytokines is, uh, is a problem. Inhibiting cytokines, not so much. We can uh, uh, inhibit cytokines like in uh, um, inflammatory bowel disease. There are inhibitors of tumor necrosis factor. And they work pretty well, um, but it's a whole different thing trying to add cytokines to a human system. Now, this is the system at work. <clears throat> I'll go, try to go back and forth, and I gather you all did not get handouts of this, and I'm, I'm sorry, it would have been much more useful. And I have no problems if the IDF wants to reproduce this and, 
and uh, uh, distribute it to you all. Okay, so let's talk about what happens when you get an infection, in this case a cold. So you have this membrane that's lining your nasal and sinus passages. This membrane is, uh, uh, has a single cell layer, and those single cells and their cilia, little hair-like projections, are sitting there and they are overlain by a layer of mucus. So this mucus is constantly being produced and being flushed up and out of the bronchial tubes and down and out of our sinuses. In order to cause an infection, the bacteria or virus has to get past this whole barrier. In order to do that, it's got to get through the mucus. It's either got to infect or kind of work its way through those cells. Severe allergic reactions can actually strip this layer off. And obviously, that's going to predispose you to some uh, uh, increased infections. So the microbe, let's say the microbe eventually gets through. What happens? It gets picked up by cells just under the uh, membrane called dendritic cells. So if this is happening in your nose, those dendritic cells are going to pick up the germ, kind of uh, um, digest it a little bit, and then move in to the lymph system. The lymph system is another entire circulatory system that we usually uh, don't think about unless you're an immunologist. And what happens is those dendritic cells carrying the germ or parts of the germ migrate to the local lymph nodes. They get into the, migrate to the local lymph nodes. If you get a splinter with a, a, a bacterium on it, the same thing happens. There are dendritic cells right under the skin that picks up the bug and goes to the regional lymph nodes. In those lymph nodes, the T cells and B cells and dendritic cells are all, again, percolating, literally percolating, through the lymphoid tissue. When the match occurs between a T cell that is specific for that germ, a B cell that's specific for that germ, and the dendritic cell presenting the germ, that's when an immune response starts. And that immune response is usually initiated when T cells are primed. And there's all kinds of T cells that we talked about. The T cells produce help <clears throat> to uh, uh, B cells that become plasma cells. They make antibodies. And some of them make antibodies that cause allergies. But the antibodies then feed back to phagocytic cells to help defend against the bacterium or whatever germ that is. Now, depending on the germ, some of the uh, T cells become uh, uh, activated to produce a different type of factor, such as gamma interferon, that fights uh, herpes infections. So this goes on all the time when you are being exposed to anything in our environment. Uh, it, it is amazing anybody survives until they're 12. Um, so uh, Dr. Steam is going to uh, talk about immune deficiencies, an in introduction. Now, primary immune deficiencies. Um, the uh, this is my definition of an immune deficiency disorder. Number one, it's a clinical phenotype. That means it's what the patient comes in with. Somebody with a B cell problem comes in with respiratory infection. Babies with a T cell problem have uh, viral infections in their blood or uh, liver, uh, et cetera. That is a phenotype. The phenotype is characterized by increased susceptibility to infection, we know that, but also malignancy in certain types, autoimmunity, and in some cases, autoinflammation. But autoimmunity, uh, it's kind of weird to think about an immune system that does both, 
too much of one thing and too little, and it's part of the same system. And the, the general term for that is immune dysregulation. It's a nice term, it encompasses all of that, but uh, in general, we don't know why that happens. Uh, CVID is a perfect example. We really have no idea why most people with CVID have CVID. Now, the primary immune deficiencies are those that are documented or presumed to be genetic uh, in origin uh, and genetic uh, mutations in immune responses. There are over 300 identified. Classic ones are X-linked A-gamma, SCID, uh, hyper IgM, and actually there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, workshops uh, or uh, talks this afternoon about a number of these, uh, or, or later this morning, of these specific disorders. AT is ataxia telangiectasia. Immune deficiencies can also be secondary or acquired. That is, some extrinsic factor induces alterations in immune responses. The classic before HIV, HIV is easy to imagine, you get a uh, virus that kills immune cells. But um, uh, before there was HIV, there was measles. Now we've gotten rid of measles with vaccine, but it's very interesting that uh, measles produces a profound uh, temporary T cell deficiency. Malnutrition, severe malnutrition, I'm not talking about you know, just a few pounds underweight uh, or a slightly low vitamin D level. We're talking about uh, people that are in starvation states. And then in a place like children's in LA, most of the immune deficiencies are caused by us. So these are kids that are being treated for cancer, rheumatologic disorders, uh, um, severe asthma. So the radiation, the, the chemo that they get, and the steroids that uh, we use uh, uh, suppress an immune system. And then finally, there are the natural immune deficiencies, if you will. Normal, these are normal developmental processes. The immune deficiency of immaturity Preemies particularly are born with uh, 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 a seriously compromised ability to make an immune response. Newborn babies, full-term newborn babies, it's not so much that they can't make an immune response, they just don't have any memory. They don't have any uh, B cells that are already primed to make antibodies. Uh, so they have to learn all of the germs they need to make antibodies against. And finally, we have the immunologic attrition of aging. And I'm afraid I'm at that place. And we know, we know that our thymuses are not doing what they used to do. Um, maybe some other things, but we won't go that far. I will be glad to answer questions at the end of the program. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'm always happy to see all these people show up at 7.30. It reminds me of an experience I had in El Paso, Texas. I was invited to give a talk at 7.30, and there was only one person in the audience. <laughs> so I looked at the clock, it was the right time, I checked my calendar, it was the right date, and so I gave my talk. And a man gave a wonderful question, and um, I answered it, and then as I was leaving the podium, he said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going back to Los Angeles. I gave my talk. He said, you can't go. I'm the second speaker. <laughs> so disclosures, I'm an editor for Up to Date. I'm an advisory board for ADMA, which is making gamma globulin for patients with transplant um, uh, that is specific for a, a respiratory syncytial virus. So we've heard what primary immunodeficiencies, a highly variable group of disorders, usually genetic, that has one or more defects of the immune system. Um, it was first identified in 1952 by uh, Colonel Bruton, 
And uh, since then, it's now been uh, found out to be X-linked a gamma globulinemia, and now there's over 300 immune deficiencies. And um, some of them are the most familiar is uh, IgA deficiency, occurs in one in 400. Severe combined immunodeficiency, which is checked in newborns, is one in 25,000. This is a, um, the original paper in pediatrics, and a lot of it came through the technology of learning to separate all the various serum proteins into albumin, alpha globulin, beta globulin, gamma globulin. And this man had access to this machine called electrophoresis, and he showed that they, this child had no um, uh, gamma globulin, did not dif differentiate between IgG, M, and A. And he started the patient on gamma globulin injections, and the child did very well, but unfortunately died at age 26 because he couldn't get enough gamma globulin because it had to be given subcutaneously by large injections at one time, which were very painful. Um, so when do you suspect immunodeficiency? If infections are chronic, recurrent, unusual, invasive, and severe, like chickenpox, um, requiring hospitalization, then evaluate. Failure to cruise may lead to a titanic disaster. So as Dr. Church pointed out, that the primary immunodeficiencies are much less common than the secondary immunodeficiencies associated with um, malignancy, associated with uh, steroid medicine or other immunosuppressive medicines, malnutrition, aging, et cetera. These are called secondary immunodeficiencies. And so you always have to differentiate between primary immunodeficiency, which is the topic of this symposium, and the secondary immunodeficiencies. The child with too many infections has um, may divi be divided into several different categories. So when the doctor sees a patient with too many infections, what does he worry about? He worries about allergy, which is 30%. Um, most of them don't have a severe problem. They're just normal, have more, more uh, exposure perhaps. Um, suffering from another chronic disease like cystic fibrosis, or it's only, only about 10% of patients overall have a true immunodeficiency. And remember that secondary immunodeficiency is more common than primary, so primary immunodeficiency is fairly rare, actually. Um, but I'd like to um, point out the five most common immunodeficiencies that occur are, first of all, prematurity, second, physiologic hypogammaglobinemia, Third, transient hypogammaglobinemia of infancy. Uh, fourth, selective antibody deficiency. And um, finally, uh, probably the Dior syndrome. Now, interestingly enough, you, every one of you, have had three of these. You've had physiologic hypogammaglobinemia, you've had transient hypogammaglobinemia of infancy, and you've had a selective antibody deficiency. And only a few of these continue in adults, uh, such as the DeGeorge syndrome and um, IgA deficiency. Um, so what do you do for immunodeficiency in terms of tests? All, most of you that have immunodeficiency have all these problems. First of all, you measure the levels of IgG, M, and A, the main immune globulins, and sometimes IgE, the allergy antibody, and sometimes IgG subclasses. Then second most important thing is how have you responded to vaccines? This is a challenge to your B cell system, your antibody system, and the usual tests are tetanus antibody, uh, H influenza antibody, and pneumococcal antibody. This is assuming that you've had those vaccines. If you haven't had those vaccines, you're not protected and we can't test your immunity. Um, and then sometimes we actually measure the B cells, which are the cells that make the immune globulin. For T cells, much more um, difficult. You can get an estimate by measuring just the total amount of lymphocytes in the bloodstream. Um, you can also do delayed hypersensitivity skin tests if you're over two, and these are like the tuberculin uh, test. You can, in a newborn, a very easy way to look for severe combined immunodeficiency if uh, testing has not been done, is to do a chest x-ray, because these kids don't have 
a, um, a lipos, uh, have a thymus. And then you can measure, as Dr. Church pointed out, the specific kinds of lymphocytes, CD3 cells, CD4 cells, CD8 cells, and then you can measure if these lymphocytes can respond to either a mitogen, a nonspecific stimulator, or a specific antigen. And then we have a number of other tests. You can complement tests. You can measure um, uh, uh, called oxidative burst in chronic granulomatous disease. You can do bone marrow biopsies. Um, or now, nowadays, if you can't figure out what's wrong, you do total exome sequencing, which will look, look for all the genes that are associated with immunodeficiency. So let's just talk about some patients. This is a three-month-old girl with a very low gamma globulin. Um, the, she was a uh, first child, birth weight five pounds. Trek screening was negative. She doesn't have severe combined immunodeficiency. She was cyanotic at birth and she was born with a single ventricle, a congenital heart disease. She had a Fontan procedure trying to correct her um, cardiac abnormality, which leads to um, uh, backup of uh, protein uh, into the um, gastrointestinal tube. And um, then she developed pneumonia, pleural effusion, and diarrhea. She was discharged at two months on antibiotics and RSV um, prophylaxis. She was admitted at three months, at which time her IgG was only 150. Her M and A were de uh, detectable. She had low levels of lymphocytes, and her albumin was low. So why did she have this? She had hypogammaglobinemia um, because one, she was born prematurity, uh, premature. She had um, uh, lots of blood draws, and then she also had blood loss uh, and serum protein loss through the gastrointestinal tract uh, because of the enteropathy. So this shows why she has uh, low levels of gamma globulin. Um, in the first, uh, in, during the fetus, the baby does not start to make uh, antibodies at all except she gets maternal antibodies from the mother starting at about four months of age, and this increases. So you can see that if she is born prematurely, she doesn't get as much gamma globulin from the mother because of poor transplacental passage. Secondly, the gamma globulin decreases um, um, as one ages before one starts to make its own. And so this period of time from three months to six months is called physiologic hypogammaglobinemia, and it's much more severe in premature because they start out with a much lower level. And then she's losing gamma globin from um, the, her uh, gastrointestinal tract, and finally she's having a lot of blood run. So she has um, physiologic hypogammaglobinemia. The maternal gamma globin disappears with a half-life of 39 days. Infant's own gamma globin is not well established in about six months of age. And um, so from everyone, uh, IgG is low from three to six months. All of you have survived this illness. This is much more severe in prematures because of decreased transplacental passage. And respiratory infections, diarrhea, and eczema are not uncommon. But you don't give gamma globin, which will actually uh, uh, inhibit the baby's own gamma globin. <coughs> Okay, it's case two, a 23-month-old girl with moderate eczema and mild diarrhea. She was growing well, but she has had increased eczema in the face and extremities for the last 10 months. She is bottle-fed and since weaning has had intermittent loose stools and weight normal for age. Her blood count is okay. She's got um, slightly high, but her lymphocytes are perfectly normal. Um, but her IgG is only 205, and IgM and IgA are normal. So what does she have? She has transient hypogammaglobin infancy, and you can see that um, by, six, by f five or six months, the baby's own gamma globin is okay, but this doesn't go up as expected, and it may remain low for the first two to four years. This is called transient hypogammaglobinemia. And yep. 
and um, is usually um, treated with antibiotics and watchful waiting. Again, gamma globulin is not usually indicated. Some of these babies are diagnosed as common variable immunodeficiency because they're about six, but sometimes this transient hypogammaglobinemia may go on for several months. Okay, let's see. Okay, this is case three. Johnny is cyanotic at birth. He was a term, uh, 2,500 gram term infant with pronounced ears, a small mandible, and tapered fingers. Mild cyanosis and tachypnea, uh, and a chest x-ray was abnormal. Showed he had a tetralogy of flow, another congenital heart disease. Um, the CB, the um, T cells were pretty good. Um, immunoglobulins were pretty good, but he had a chromosomal abnormality, the most common chromosomal abnormality after Down syndrome that occurs in um, individuals. And one parent had the same deletion. It's a deletion of uh, 22Q11, one of the chromosomes. And this baby looks like this. He's, you can see he's had, had prominent ears, sort of an unusual mouth, and he's got a midline thoracic scar indicating he's post-surgical. So this baby has DeGeorge syndrome. You'll hear a lot about this in other um, episodes. A T-cell defect with thymic and parathyroid absence and selective antibody deficiency, which we'll talk about in a minute. Is, um, is, these have um, unusual facies very tapered fingers, neonatal tetanase, low ca calcium, cardiac outflow tracts, microcephaly, developmental delay. And they also have swallowing problems and difficulty with autoimmunity. Um, it's occasionally familial, male in, in, in versus female. Only 5% of them, though, have severe immunologic problems, and many of them grow up to be adults. Many are institutionalized because nearly every one of them is somewhat uh, mentally challenged. Um, the treatment is cardiac treatment, and, uh, operations, calcium, vitamin D, bone marrow, or thymic transplant, and we measure the fish on the, on the parents, the fluorescent uh, um, immunologic test for, on the parents to treat infection. <clears throat> Case four. Jonah, a four-year-old boy with cough and recurrent infection, with recurrent fever, normal delivery, fully immunized. For the last four months, he has had three respiratory infections with low-grade fever, um, circles under his eyes, and cobblestoning um, in the back of the throat, suggesting lymphoid follicles, secondary to sinusitis, and adenopathy. The chest x-ray was normal, white count was okay, Dead rate was slightly elevated. IgG were normal. Um, uh, IgE, the, an the allergy antibody was okay, and Waters' view showed bilateral maxillary sinusitis. Um, throat culture was normal. Labs, IgG 520, M and A were okay. These are all pretty normal. Dead rate was slightly elevated. He had protective antibodies to H flu and tetanus, but he didn't respond appropriately to pneumococcal vaccine. He made it fine to the um, uh, Prevnar vaccine, the protein vaccine, but he didn't do well to the carbohydrate vaccine. So he has an illness called specific antibody deficiency, also known as impaired polysaccharide responsiveness. This occurs in all of you until about 24 months of age. And so you, you don't make antibodies to polysaccharide antigens, which are important in pneumococcus and H. influenza, so you're associated with more frequent respiratory infection. And their other antibodies are okay to tetanus, but they have a poor antibody response to the polysaccharide vaccine, which is called Pneumovax, but they do respond to Prevnar. This is probably, in my experience, the most common immunodeficiency that we see. Um, usually transient, sometimes lifelong, common in, elder, in, uh, in the elderly and also in other pr uh, uh, primary immunodeficiencies. Treatments are antibiotics, PRN, or prophylactic. Sometimes we give these patients uh, 
uh, weekly azithromycin, and we try to develop uh, immunity by giving them Prevnar, which will cover 13 um, polysaccharide, 13 um, serotypes of, uh, of pneumococcus, but not the polysaccharide types, which are uh, um, represented in the 23 pneumococcal vaccine. Okay, the last case is case five, an eight-year-old boy with a stuffy nose and milk intolerance. Uh, he's uh, had mild diarrhea, uh, improved when he stopped drinking milk. He also gets mild abdominal pain and headaches. A skin test in milk was po weekly positive. A maternal uncle receives IVIG for CVID. Physical exam is normal except for poor weight growing. Labs show uh, slightly low uh, hemoglobin, um, normal differential except for 8% eosinophils, which suggests um, a uh, allergic problem, and sed rate is slightly elevated. As you can see from his immunoglobulins, the IgG was normal, the IgM was normal, but the IgA was absent. Uh, his IgE, which is slightly elevated, suggests he has allergy. <clears throat> so, um, Skin tests uh, and blood tests uh, for uh, uh, milk IgE was positive. Um, his IgG subclasses were slightly abnormal. He had a low IgG2, although the IgG1 and 3 and 4 were perfectly okay. Vaccines were normal. He had a slightly positive anti-nuclear antibody, and he did have anti-IgA antibodies uh, plus milk precipitants. Uh, serum iron was slightly low. So this boy had selective IgA deficiency with iron deficiency and milk allergy. It's not known what causes this. It's sometimes familial and sometimes it occurs in families that has common variable immunodeficiency. 25% of these patients are perfectly normal. They just happen to have immunoglobulin and it was shown to have IgA deficiency. Um, <clears throat> 25% uh, have respiratory allergies, 25% have autoimmunity, and um, uh, <clears throat> so only 25% of them have respiratory infections. One in 400, the most common serious primary immunodeficiency. Um, it's also been associated with rare allergic reactions to uh, gamma globin because if you don't make IgA, you can make antibodies to IgA. However, these usually don't cause any problems. Occasionally, um, uh, they do. It can occur with anaphylaxis, but um, for the most part, it doesn't cause any trouble. Uh, and if you do have it, you can give a subcutaneous gamma globin without trouble. These patients are told to avoid IVIG. If necessary, use subcutaneous immunoglobulin. Um, antibiotics can be given with respiratory infections and many of these patients should wear a medic alert badge if they're sensitive to gamma globin. Um, partial IgA deficiency is a non-disease. Even if the IgA is slightly low, it doesn't seem to cause disease, so it's a, a misdiagnosis. Um, other important but less common PIDs are X-linked A gamma globinemia is in the first case. Common variable immunodeficiency is the most common need for gamma globulin. Severe combined immunodeficiency now with newborn screening is, um, can be treated with stem cell transplants or even gene therapy. And chronic granulomatous disease, which is a white cell disease where you, the white cells can't kill um, organisms, um, can, uh, uh, is another serious, we have a special a separate symposium on this. Um, just a word about common variable immunodeficiency. It's an intrinsic B cell defect. Variable T cell defect occurs after age 10 with URI, sinusitis, pneumonia, diarrhea, and autoimmunity, malignancy, and um, auto uh, and granuloma are common. These patients all have very low IgGs and um, <clears throat> and don't make good antibodies following vaccines. B cells are present, um, but all, the antibody function is poor. Um, the treatment is IVIG, antibiotics, and treatment of the complications. 
Severe combined immunodeficiency is another one in which babies are born without any immunity whatsoever. They are very susceptible to pneumocystis, a very unusual parasitic disease. Um, they're identified because um, by using the heel stick blood test uh, for T cell restriction excision circles, which measures early um, um, newborn T cells production. And uh, uh, treatment is a stem cell transplant gene therapy for certain forms of this, the most severe immunologic problem that we face. And this is a patient that has severe fungal disease all over the face and herpes simplex. So if you haven't seen what a T cell and B cell looks like, that's what they do. And the reason why the T cells are so important is because they, uh, they are the conductor of the immunologic orchestra. So if you have a decreased or low absent T cells, you're very, very ill. And that's why AIDS is so bad, because it knocks out the CD3, CD4 cell that are the uh, viral, in fact, uh, viral um, receptor and also responsible for taking care of the disease. So if you have a deficiency of CD4 cells, you have a serious problem. And then finally, chronic granulomatous disease is also has normal T cells, normal B cells, but the white cells are normal in number, but they don't function, they don't kill, and they um, need lifelong antibiotic therapy. And there's a special test that you can go do it called the uh, nitro blue, uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, dihydrorhodamine test for diagnosis. And the reason why they don't um, kill is because they don't make enough Clorox. The body makes a fourth of a cup of Clorox every single day enough to uh, do your laundry. So in summary, primary immunodeficiencies are less common than the secondary immunodeficiencies. Infections, autoimmunity, and cancer are complications. Most common are the um, antibody defects. The most severe are the cellular immunodeficiency. Many tests are available, treatments including antibiotics, um, immunoglobulin, stem cell therapy, preventive measures, decreasing exposure, give some vaccines for certain patients, uh, and genetic counseling, and the IDF has much material for infections. Now finally, if you don't understand this talk, I suggest to Charlie Brown, my uncle has always wanted to play the violin. Last week he went down to a music store and he bought one. Then he went to a concert to watch the violinists play to see how they did it. Then he went home, picked up his new violin, and tried it himself. He couldn't play at all. <laughs> the next time he tr goes to a concert, he's going to try sitting <laughs> closer. Next time, sit closer. Thank you. So thank you very much to our speakers for uh, two great presentations. We do have a few minutes, and we'll try to get uh, to some of the questions. So um, I'm going to ask, actually, Joe, don't sit down. Um, you're the first question. Uh, if someone had, and unfortunately, there's no microphones here, so you're going to have to come back uh, up here to, to give your answer. So if someone has T cells, but they don't recognize a certain invader, do their B cells still work? The B cells will still work, but not to that bug. Okay, so that uh, B cells need to be told most of the time, need to be told by T cells when to make their antibody. And another question for you. Can T cells be fixed or replaced? Yes, that's what bone marrow transplant's all about. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, particularly at this point in time, we're really entering a new era in uh, the management of these severe T cell uh, um, uh, defects by uh, gene therapy. And even more exciting is gene correction, where you take the patient's cells and chemically fix the, def the genetic defect in their own DNA. 
Okay, Dr. Steam, is CVID rare? It's rare compared to the general population, but it's um, the most common reason to give gamma globulin. So if you just start surveying normal individuals, you're not going to find it very often, perhaps uh, one in a thousand. If a person is diagnosed with specific antibody deficiency, does it often develop into another type of immunodeficiency like CVID? Um, I don't think it develops into it, but I think that um, many of the patients that are diagnosed as transient hypogammaglobinemia actually have early onset common variable immunodeficiency. And so that almost all patients with common variable immunodeficiency are diagnosed after age 10. So if a child is diagnosed at five years old with common variable immunodeficiency, more likely got a late onset uh, uh, transient hypogammaglobinemia. What is the DHR test for chronic granulomatous disease? Well, it's a test that it used to be a nitro blue tetrasolium test. It, tell, it tests for the ability of cells to make hydrogen peroxide. And now it's done by flow cytometry where they stimulate um, di with this substance called dihydrorhodamine and it, it turns color and that's the diagnosis. So it's a better test than the old NBT test. Can you still have allergies if you have hypogammaglobulinemia? Uh, if you have severe agammaglobulinemia, you're not going to get allergies because you'll have a very low IgE. But most patients don't have complete lack, and they indeed can get allergy. Um, that's very complex. You answer it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, here's, here's a difficult one. What is mannose binding lectin, and what does it do within the immune system? Well, it's a unusual protein, much like the complement proteins, and it helps to phagocytize uh, cells. So bacteria um, need complement, uh, complement lands on bacteria and allows them to be phagocytized. And uh, people that have uh, a lectin deficiency sometimes will have trouble with infections, but it is extremely rare. I've only seen uh, oh, two patients in a long time. Is it common for a patient with CVID to develop chronic kidney disease? Um, it's not unusual. One of the problems with common variable immunodeficiency is that you can get multiple infections. And when you have infections, you develop um, materials that get into your bloodstream and can shut down the kidney. And so that uh, renal kidney disease and kidney failure could occur in common variable immunodeficiency, but it's not likely. Um, I have CVID and orthostatic hypotension. Do you know of a reason why low blood pressure could be related to my immune deficiency? I've not heard of that. Maybe Tony might know. Um, no, I think it's, it's doubtful that it's a, an effect of the CVID itself. It's probably either some other condition, possibly medication related, um, or some other aspect of, of your individual medical situation. So these are all either kind of generic or complicated. Um, so um, do you have any experience with antibiotic sinus sprays? Um, yes, uh, uh, some often following surgery, they will give antibiotics uh, locally by a spray, but it's not used prophylactically or very common. Um, anytime you blow something into the nose, you can sensitize a person much more easier than the oral route. <laughs> um, 